I Am the Knight is a game mode exclusive to Arkham Origins, which seeks to offer a brand new level of difficulty to players looking for it. In this mode, many things are changed from the main game, such as certain enemy types being introduced much earlier than usual, or armored thugs being put into predator encounters. But the most notable change that I Am the Knight makes is the inclusion of permadeath. If you die at any point in your I Am the Knight playthrough, you are no longer just sent back to the last checkpoint. Now you're sent back to the beginning of the game. Just a few tiny bad decisions can cost you hours and hours of progress in an instant. I Am the Knight is brutal and unforgiving, but I guess my viewers didn't think it was brutal enough, because you all voted for me to be I Am the Knight without obtaining any upgrades. And when I tell you that this is the most difficult gaming challenge I have ever done, I am not lying. Congratulations, Dog Vader 4681 because today I'm going to answer the question, can you beat Batman Arkham Origins I Am the Knight without any upgrades? For full transparency, I will tell you now that I did not play through the entirety of the normal game and New Game Plus in order to unlock I Am the Knight. Instead, I used Cheat Engine to unlock I Am the Knight straight from the startup of a brand new file. This didn't end up affecting the difficulty of the challenge in any way, it only served to save me a bunch of time. And this video has already taken much longer to come out than it should have. Also, I've made another channel called Splinter Chalk Proof, where I've uploaded the entirety of my successful run. So if you want proof that I really did beat the game this way, or just want to watch the entire challenge for yourself, that video will be linked in the description. The rules for this challenge are simple. Obviously, I must play on I Am The Knight. I am not allowed to use the restart from checkpoint option to cheat my way out of a death. If I'm about to die, I need to accept it and let it happen. Absolutely no upgrades can be obtained. Whether through spending level up points or the completion of Dark Knight challenges, I am not allowed to acquire any upgrades. And finally, intentional use of glitches is not allowed. Whether it's a major glitch like skipping entire sections of the game, or something as small as animation cancels, I am not allowed to intentionally use glitches as a means of making things easier for me. So with that out of the way, let's get into the challenge. The beginning of my first run was pretty uneventful. Blackgate is an insanely easy introductory sequence to the game, and even on I Am The Night, Croc is baby easy as a boss fight. It wasn't long before I found myself at the GCR Tower, and this was where I was presented with a big issue. Something I hadn't fully considered until this moment was the fact that Arkham Origins has one of the worst upgrade systems ever created, as it introduces the Dark Knight system. The Dark Knight system is broken up into four categories, each with its own list of 15 challenges. Three of these four categories have a unique set of rewards other than experience points, which are given to the player when they complete the first three challenges of that category in order. The Gotham Protector category makes it extremely easy to avoid obtaining its upgrade, since the third challenge requires you to complete an optional AR gliding drill. The Shadow Vigilante category revolves around combat, and was by far the most difficult to work around. The first three challenges of the Shadow Vigilante category are Perform 5 Counters Use the Quickfire Batarang three times while in combat And reach a x8 combo multiplier I know for a fact that beating the game without reaching a x8 combo multiplier isn't possible, and while it may very well be possible to beat the game without performing 5 counters, there was no way I was going to be attempting that without any upgrades. This left me with one option, which was to disregard the insanely useful strategy of spamming the quickfire battering. What this really meant was that instead of abusing my L2 button, I would have to actually get good at the game. The worst nightmare category presented its own layer of difficulty. The first three challenges in the Worst Nightmare category are Perform an Inverted Takedown, Event Takedown, and a Wall Takedown Perform three Silent Takedowns in a single Predator Encounter And Finish a Predator Encounter without being seen And this is where I finally get back to talking about the GCR Tower that I mentioned 20 hours ago Because here, Stealth is tutorialized And in this tutorial, the game prompts you to perform an Inverted Takedown Then Event Takedown And then a Wall Takedown this instantly completed the challenge I was hoping to avoid, since from now on I would either have to give up silent takedowns or allow myself to be spotted before finishing any predator encounter. And given the fact that on this difficulty I can only get shot a single time and survive, that second option was not looking too appealing, but we'll get more into that later. For now, I simply went through the GCR tower as normal, taking out thugs, unlocking the tower, and making my way into the city. 
Jezebel Plaza, the second GCR tower, and Penguin SIM cards were nothing special, since even on this high a difficulty, the opening of the game was pretty easy. So, before too long, I found myself approaching the final offer, where the snipers used their spidey sense to locate me before I was anywhere near the ship. Luckily, I was able to escape their view, surviving with about a third of my health left. I still wasn't in the clear, though, since before I could go into the final offer, I had to take out eight armed thugs. Both snipers went down with silent takedowns, and the Batclaw helped me take care of most of the others. But, being the absolute genius I am, I made the decision to perform a third silent takedown on this guy, completing the Dark Knight challenge I had specifically told myself not to complete. But it wasn't the end of the world. I mean, sure, the run was now a thousand times harder than it was 30 seconds earlier, but that didn't mean it was impossible. So, I took down the rest of these guys and made my way inside the final offer, where I went through a few more relatively easy combat encounters before arriving at the first major choke point in this challenge, Electrocutioner. Jokes aside, I did actually try to die to Electrocutioner, but unfortunately, no matter what I did, he refused to hit me. The fight that followed this was far from easy. This fight acquainted me with a lot of the most annoying things that would consistently happen during this challenge. My special combo takedowns were locking onto the wrong thugs. Enemies were hitting me with boxes just milliseconds before I was about to hit them. And martial artists were brought into existence. But despite these challenges, I managed to just barely scrape my way through the encounter and continue through the final offer. The fights in the casino went flawlessly, with me not getting hit even a single time. And with the casino done, it was time for my first standard interior predator encounter. There really isn't much to say about the theater, because this room was easier than an Arkham Asylum boss fight. I just picked everyone off one by one and then let myself get spotted before taking down the last two thugs. And after a short brawl against some of Penguin's guys, it was time to fight Deathstroke. And, as always, I was a complete god gamer throughout the entire fight. In fact, I was able to beat Deathstroke without getting hit a single time in this run, which was the first time I've ever done that on my Steam account. With Deathstroke down, I headed to Lacey Towers to solve a murder for the first of 800 times before heading to the Batcave to grab the Arkham Gadget equivalent of a turn signal on a BMW. That is to say, completely useless. And not only is the Concussion Detonator completely useless as a gadget, it's also the first reason this challenge is impossible, because gadgets in this game count as upgrades. But that didn't mean I wasn't going to continue trying. With the Concussion Detonator in hand, it was time for me to go and make my way into the GCPD which wasn't difficult, since with the snipers gone, taking out the rest of the cops on the roof was as easy as- Yeah, so this death was just pure stupidity on my part. After luring everyone except for this cop away, I decided to take him down. But, after getting hit by the battering, the cop did his best Black Canary impression and screamed, attracting all the other cops to his location. And, rather than playing it safe and running away, I decided to continue on with my plan. My second run didn't go much better, as I didn't even leave Blackgate before calling it quits. During Croc's boss fight, I somehow didn't realize that quick-firing Batarangs would cause the Dark Knight challenge to be completed, meaning I had already made the game impossible to finish. This did help teach me something, though. Since my second attempt was done on the same save as my first, I now knew that progress in the Dark Knight challenges saves between attempts. So, from here on out, I made sure that instead of starting new attempts in the same save files as old attempts, I would start new attempts from a freshly installed save file. My third run started off a lot better than the previous two. Overall, I was just doing so much better in combat. Enemies all around were becoming easier to deal with, and aside from one small slip-up where I quick-fired a battering, I was doing good at avoiding the completion of Dark Knight challenges. At least until I got to the casino on the final offer. Upon entering the casino, there were three thugs waiting, an armed thug, a martial artist, and an armored thug. So, in order to try and take them out as quick as possible, I did a silent takedown on the armed thug before trying to do a double takedown on the armored and martial artist. Batman instead tried to silent takedown the armored thug, which was apparently enough for me to complete the perform three silent takedowns in a single predator encounter Dark Knight challenge. Who was the game counting as the first of the three silent takedowns? Who knows? Anyways, the rest of the final offer was a breeze, so I headed to Lacey Towers, grabbed the concussion detonator, and decided to play it safe and not be an idiot on the GCPD rooftop. That being said, I did still receive a non-lethal shotgun blast to the face when this cop turned around just seconds before I was about to take him out. 
While this was a little scary, I wasn't too concerned, since I knew there was an Enigma data pack nearby that I could use to get some EXP, which should allow me to heal a bit. But apparently, collectibles don't heal you when picked up in this game like they do in Arkham City. So, it was time to strap on my ultra stealthy Black Panther What Are Those sneakers and take the rest of these cops out in a sneaky and indirect manner. The interior of the GCPD was more or less the same as everything else up until now. The first few combat encounters were extremely easy since the groups were pretty small. And before anyone asks, no. I did not take out all of the cops in this room. Initially, I did plan to, but after seeing how many of them were armored, I decided to save myself the pain of dying here a hundred times. The bullpen predator encounter was pretty easy, with inverted takedowns and propane tanks helping me take down the majority of the room. I did have a close call towards the end, but managed to get by with only one new hole being added to my body. And with the bullpen cleared, I fought my way through the holding cells, grabbed the second mandatory upgrade of the run, and headed back to the holding cells for round two. I won't lie, this second group kicked my ass harder than you could ever imagine. But that was nothing a little cowardice couldn't handle. After running away, I managed to throw a smoke pellet and then used a remote claw on a propane tank to instant- Now, we're 36 hours into this video, and I still haven't gotten past the GCPD. So for time's sake, I'll just quickly run through all the noteworthy events up until the holding cells. Run 4 was weird. At Blackgate, I failed to blow up one of the tanks during the croc boss fight, so he ended up brutally murdering this black mask thug. My issues with the perform 3 silent takedowns Dark Knight challenge in the casino persisted. At Lacey Towers, I unlocked the ability to phase my enemies through the floors, a power I would use quite frequently throughout my runs. And finally, on the GCPD rooftop, I began the strat of backclawing one sniper and then immediately doing a silent takedown on the other to start the encounter off. And with that, we're already back to the holding cells. The fight here went much better than last time. I was able to quickly disable the Venom user's Venom tank, making him a complete non-threat. After that, I simply continued the fight as normal, getting my ass kicked in the second half, but still managing to get through it all with about a quarter of my health left. The rest of the GCPD was insanely easy, and before too long I was onto the sewers. The overflow fight went extremely well, with me only taking a single hit right at the end of the encounter. From here I murdered this armored thug by throwing his unconscious body into raw sewage, had a not so great but still successful fight on the elevator, and then had the most flawless fight anybody has ever seen before accessing the National Criminal Database. Up next was the Gotham Merchants Bank, which started out good enough. The bridge in the middle of the bank presents the perfect opportunity to knock out thug after thug with minimal effort. That paired with inverted takedowns let me take out all but two thugs without ever being spotted. And it was here that I made a fatal error. With just two thugs remaining and both of them grouped up, I threw a smoke pellet and used my powers of merging my enemies into the ground to take one of them down, at which point the other immediately surrendered. And because me and my caveman brain forgot that this was how the encounter ended, this meant I had just finished a predator encounter without being spotted, thus completing the third Dark Knight challenge in the worst nightmare category and obtaining the Sonic Batarang. Literally nothing noteworthy happened in run 5, and I died during the boiler deck fight. Run 6 started out normal, but got interesting when I made it to the final offer. After clearing this fight, a thug that will henceforth be known as Michelangelo Carl Hines decided to wave the white stun baton of defeat and change his ways. But I didn't just accept this change of heart. I mean, surely he was faking. So I tried everything I could think of. Punching, cape stuns, smoke pellets, explosive gel. But after my repeated attempts at initiating violence, he stayed steadfast in his newfound policy of pacifism. Michelangelo simply would not budge on his morals. What kind of a man was I? To look into the eyes of a rehabilitated man and tell him no. To try and revert him into the hardened, pugilistic criminal he once was. How can I be Gotham's protector if I'm unwilling to accept the fact that my enemies can change? That day I didn't just meet a reformed criminal. I didn't just make an ally. I made a friend. So then I used a remote control batarang to knock him out and went about the rest of the game as normal. Run 6 finally ended at the steel mill when I met my demise trying to take out the thugs guarding the outside. I threw down a smoke pellet to keep myself hidden while taking out a thug. But that didn't exactly help me when I decided to get greedy and jump out of the smoke for some extra takedowns. Run 7 was where I really started to get into my zone. 
By the time I made it to the steel mill, the only close call I had was in the GCPD, where these cops pounded me harder than Batman did Batgirl in the greatest animated movie of all time. Terrible jokes aside, this run was going amazing. Heading into the steel mill, I had not only become a combat expert, capable of cracking the skulls of any single father who dared to shoplift bread for his starving children, I had also become a master tactician. In the Predator encounter outside the steel mill, I took down both snipers loudly so that all of the thugs would run to them, leaving the jammer unguarded so I could easily go down and disable it. It was masterful tactics like this and straight up murder that would help make Run 7 one of the best. The combat encounters in the steel mill didn't present too much of a challenge. Three of them are against pretty small groups, but the warehouse fight was a little different. The really large groups present here made things difficult, and the armored thugs and brute didn't make things any easier. I got hit quite a few times, but in the end still managed to come out on top. The drug lab predator encounter was extremely scary going in. Throughout the entire encounter, detective mode is jammed, and the jammer is in a different room, making it impossible to use the disruptor on it. There's also multiple armored thugs and two snipers, which are pretty much a death sentence if they spot me. But, as it turns out, I was worried for nothing, because the thugs in this room are stupider than Batman when he didn't call the Justice League for help. Despite multiple attempts at taking down the thugs in the stupidest ways possible, they never managed to spot or damage me. These thugs were so dumb that I was even able to perform four inverted takedowns off the same gargoyle without any consequence. And after the threat of the world's most inept thugs were taken care of, it was time to get myself drugged by the local dominatrix before proving that the Hammer of Justice is in fact unisex. I won't lie, I did cheese Copperhead's boss fight. Copperhead is such a difficult boss during I Am The Night because of two main factors, her ability to dodge your attacks and her attacks not being obviously telegraphed, making them hard to spot without counter icons. However, by diving over a Copperhead clone and then immediately attacking the one you just dove over, you can ensure that your attack won't be dodged and that none of the others in the group will have time to hit you. I used this strategy to get through the first two phases of the fight, still taking quite a few hits because I'm the worst gamer of all time. The third phase was even easier, since by just placing Explosive Gel in the center of the arena, I could instantly take down one or two clones created by her dash attack. And after doing that a couple thousand times, I grabbed the cure and proceeded to turn Copperhead into a red stain on the floor. Up next was the Royal Hotel, but before going in, I wanted to take a look at my Dark Knight challenge progress. At this point, I was at 2 out of 3 for the Use the Quick Fire Batarang 3 times during combat challenge, and was still on the Perform 3 Silent Takedowns in a Single Predator Encounter challenge. This meant that going into the Royal Hotel, Predator sections were still fairly easy, but combat sections were where I had to be extra careful. The combat encounter in the parking garage went a lot like the warehouse fight, with me getting my ass handed to me before eventually remembering how to play the game and ending the fight with a pretty decent combo. The hotel lobby also went extremely well. Using my knowledge as a master tactician, I started by taking down this thug loudly so I could lure everyone up to the top level and then use the bat claw or remote claw to pull all of them over the ledges. This plan didn't end up working, but it did get the jammer thug stuck on a ladder. Just as usual, I made use of remote control batarangs and inverted takedowns to clear most of the room. And with that out of the way, I was able to loot the shot gloves from Electrocutioner's body, which do unfortunately count as an upgrade. On my way to the ballroom, I was once again able to put my power of warping enemies through objects to use when I forced this thug into the correct position for a ground takedown. Saving Joker's hostages was no different than usual, and the following combat encounter went really well, with me finally getting a short taste of how great the shot gloves are. The panorama fight went really well too, and after that I found myself at the Royal Hotel swimming pool. This predator section started out great, with me doing an inverted takedown right in front of one of Bane's mercenaries, causing me to get shot and almost die only 10 seconds into the encounter. And as if having such a close call wasn't scary enough, after three more takedowns the mines on the gargoyles were activated, making it significantly harder to hide from the mercenaries. I had yet another close call when this armored thug spotted me getting into the grates. Lucky for me though, he decided that instead of just shooting me, he would throw a grenade, which gave me more than enough time to escape. And from here, I made careful use of great takedowns and a smoke pellet to clear out the rest of the remaining thugs. But even more difficult than taking down a room of highly trained and armed mercenaries was doing a puzzle that I already knew the answer to, because this elevator took me ages to open. 
But with that out of the way, it was time to move on to what I was anticipating to be the most difficult part of the challenge so far, Bane. But, much to my surprise, Bane was extremely easy to take down in this run. I was very patient during the first two phases, waiting for the perfect moment to perform an ultra stun and attack him. And before I knew it, I was doing my best Aiden Pierce impression and heading into phase 3 of the boss fight. Phase 3 opens up with Bane purchasing the Pain Train perk from Fallout 4 and trying his best to use it on me. But little did he know that the ancient technique of running around in a circle is more than enough to render this attack completely useless. Phase 3 went more or less the exact same as the first two, with me waiting for an opening to use my Ultra Stuns and Shot Gloves to whittle down Bane's health. I did get a bit greedy at one point, causing Bane to grab and damage me, but after quick firing the Concussion Detonator, I was able to stun him long enough to get my revenge. And after just one more cycle of Bane train and attacks, I defeated him while only getting hit a single time. I'm not going to lie, I really thought my first time fighting Bane would be the end of my run, but I guess I overestimated the difficulty. In a cruel and ironic twist of fate, Joker laughed hysterically at me while I witnessed my run being killed by the completion of two Dark Knight challenges that I knew for a fact I had not completed. As it turns out, this was because this Dark Knight challenge lies straight to your face by presenting you with almost entirely false criteria. Not only is the bit saying that your combo multiplier must be greater than 3 very inconsistent, but the idea that you even have to quickfire a batarang at all is a lie. As I found out in a later run, quickfiring the concussion detonator also counts towards this counter, meaning that the single concussion detonator I used while fighting Bane was what caused me to fail. I had now failed my 7th attempt in the most unbelievably stupid way possible. Needless to say, I was far too disheartened to bring my A game these next few attempts. And since the video has already gone on for 3 to 5 business days, I'm going to speedrun explaining these next few attempts. Run 8 started out with a very interesting development, as I discovered that the first GCR tower actually doesn't require you to complete the Perform an Inverted Takedown, Event Takedown, and a Wall Takedown Dark Knight Challenge. By simply gliding behind this thug, I was able to perform a silent takedown, and by waiting until this thug was looking in a certain direction, I had enough time to open the vent cover and take him down the same way. The third thug still had to be taken down with a wall takedown, but this meant that as long as I didn't perform both an inverted and vent takedown, I would be able to use as many silent takedowns and remain as undetected as I wanted. This didn't save me from avoiding trouble at the GCPD though, since my Batclaw 1 sniper and then silent takedown the other strat went horribly wrong and cost me this run. In run 9 I found out that you can avoid using a vent takedown on this cop in the GCPD, by simply opening the vent normally and then taking him down the old fashioned way. In this hallway of the GCPD I added an extra decoration to this poster after finishing a beatdown on an armored cop. At this point, I'm seriously beginning to wonder whether Joker or Batman will have a higher body count by the time I'm done. And Run 9 ended just outside the steel mill. With only one thug left, I had the genius idea of trying to get him to come up to me instead of just going down to him. This resulted in me getting shot, at which point I pissed myself and ran to cover. I probably should have just grappled away though, because taking cover behind metal bars with massive gaps didn't do a great job of protecting me from bullets. In Run 10, I destroyed the entire next generation of this martial artist's family before I decided to quit the run in the GCPD. I quit the run because this is where I confirmed the Concussion Detonator does in fact count towards the Quickfire Battering Dark Knight Challenge. Run 11 was by far the stupidest death of the entire challenge. At the start of the run, I switched to the Dark Knight suit, but once I got to the GCPD, I ended my recording session and shut off the game. Upon loading the game back up, I was in the regular suit instead of the Dark Knight suit, but rather than taking the time to go all the way back to the Batcave to change my suit, I figured I'd just use the cheat console to do it, since it wouldn't affect gameplay and is purely cosmetic. The way you change suits with the cheat console is by typing in this command, followed by the name of the suit you want to change into while on a death screen, since doing it while not being on a death screen causes the game to crash. You see where I'm going with this yet? I legitimately opened up the cheat console, typed in the word suicide, and pressed enter while doing a permadeath run. Run 12 went really well, and was actually the run where I ended up finally beating this godforsaken challenge. All around, the combat encounters this run were amazing. I finished the overflow encounter with a 51 combo, 
ended the parking garage combat encounter with a 37 combo. And at one point in the panorama fight, I had an 81 combo. By this point, the gamer juices were flowing through my veins, and nothing except for one of Bane's mercenaries wearing body armor and carrying a shotgun could stop me. Unfortunately, that's exactly what was waiting for me in the Royal Hotel pool. Towards the end of this Predator encounter, I performed a ledge takedown on this thug, which got me spotted at the last second. I ran away and hid in the grate, where it seemed like I had managed to get away from the extremely risky takedown unscathed. At least until the armored guy decided to snipe me from above, killing me in a single shot. Having been such a god gamer in Run 12, the game decided to step up the difficulty in Run 13 by giving my enemies superpowers like super speed and levitation. So, I responded with a little superpower of my own, by mind controlling my enemies into fighting each other at multiple points during the run. Like when I forced this cop to throw a can of soup at his coworker, or when I made this brute kill two of his friends for my own amusement. But even with this newfound and incredibly mighty power, I still wasn't strong enough to go toe to toe with this random thug during the Bane boss fight. And with that, we're finished speedrunning these explanations. Run 14 started out fairly typically. I kicked absolute ass for the entire first hour of the run. Croc's boss fight, the boiler deck, the casino, the theater. This might as well have been a no damage run with how little I was getting hit. And then I went on to beat Deathstroke without getting hit for the fourth time this challenge. After that, I went ahead and solved the Lacey Towers murder for the six millionth time, grabbed the concussion detonator, and snuck inside the GCPD without being spotted. And when I got inside the GCPD, you will never guess who I saw. It was Michelangelo! It turns out that after our last meeting, he decided to stop being a pacifist and instead put his fighting talents to use on the side of justice by becoming a corrupt cop. It was so nice to see that he had turned his life around, so I gave him a little pat on the back of the head to show him how proud I was before heading out to continue the run. By this point, I had played through the first few hours so many times that I was pretty much just on autopilot up until the steel mill. That's not to say I was playing great, though, but things were starting to turn around towards the end of the steel mill. I got through the entire Copperhead boss fight while only getting hit twice, and the Royal Hotel was where I really stepped up my game. Combat encounter after combat encounter, I was coming out with extremely high combos. And as if my combat prowess wasn't enough, I also managed to get through the entirety of the Pool Predator encounter without taking any damage or even being spotted. Needless to say, despite a bit of worry still existing in the back of my mind, I was pretty confident going into the first Bane fight. And that confidence wasn't misplaced, because I managed to get through the fight with over half my health still left. In the first two phases, I only got hit once, because Bane forgot this was an Injustice 2 and used his command grab. Heading into phase 3, my camera got stuck super close to Batman for whatever reason. As tempted as I was to try and beat the fight like this, I decided to reload from last checkpoint after seeing just how terrifying the Bane train was with such limited visibility. I didn't notice it at the time, but this did end up restoring a tiny bit of health. So technically the run failed here, but I didn't know it at the time and so kept going. Joker's hallucination was pretty easy, since as far as I know, it's literally impossible to die here, meaning that the only way I could fail the challenge here would be quickfiring his razor cards. Up next was the GCPD morgue, but before I could go there, I had to go and pick up the fifth and final upgrade mandated by this challenge, the glue grenade. The fight outside the sewers was a mixed bag. Things started out great, with me getting my combo all the way up to 57 before accidentally dropping it. And from there, things went downhill. I was scared that this would be it. But despite my fears, I got through the fight, finishing off the last cop with an astounding times 4 combo multiplier. The morgue was a simple crime scene investigation, and with that it was time for Bane's HQ, which was insanely difficult. Anyways, next up is the Gotham Pioneers Bridge! The Pioneers Bridge was something I was deathly afraid of throughout the entire run, and as it turns out, my fears were mostly unjustified. The combat sections here are either against really small groups, or were made trivial by the shock gloves. And the Predator sections, although intimidating at first, turned out to be a lot less threatening than I had anticipated. First up was the Predator encounter in the boiler room. This room was very scary at first, since I thought the vantage points would all be rigged with explosives. I was also scared of the thug with the jammer, since he tends to hide out underneath the second layer, making it very difficult to take him down or use the disruptor on him. But neither of those turned out to be a real issue, because not only were most of the vantage points not rigged like I thought they were, but the remote control battering made this room the easiest encounter known to man. 
I just used the remote control battering to toss everybody over ledges, with some falling greater distances than others. After interrogating the last thug, I began disarming Firefly's bombs. The first was in the room I had just cleared, so that was easy enough. The second was guarded by four basic armed thugs, making it extremely easy to get to and disarm. The third gave me the most trouble, since two armored thugs thought this was the end of Red Dead Redemption. But that wasn't anything that a smoke pellet and the shot gloves couldn't handle. With the third bomb disarmed, it was time to fight Firefly himself. Going into the Firefly fight, I was already scared, but things were made even worse when I realized something partway through the fight. After hitting him with the first glue grenade, I made the realization that I would have to manually aim and throw every single batarang used to damage him. This added a whole new layer of difficulty to the fight. Now I don't just have to get through the fight with a single health bar, I have to do it at a much slower pace than usual, giving Firefly far more opportunities to attack me. Needless to say, the run ended here, when Firefly obliterated my health bar before I was even on to phase 2. I didn't let him kill me though, and instead restarted from last checkpoint so that I could practice the Firefly fight a bit. And after practicing, guess what else I discovered? Not only does this Dark Knight challenge count the concussion detonator, it also counts the glue grenade. As if the inability to quick fire batterings wasn't bad enough, I now had to beat Firefly without quick firing anything other than the bat claw. But instead of continuing to practice and figuring out how to beat Firefly, I decided to ignore this problem and go through my next few attempts. Run 15 ended in the GCPD bullpen when a cop randomly decided to turn around and kill me just as I was approaching to perform a silent takedown. Run 16 was an even more embarrassing death. After completing the first GCR tower, I decided to switch to keyboard and mouse controls for gliding, but for whatever reason, the game had bound every single control to the left mouse button, causing me to take a bit of damage from these random criminals. And with this decreased health, I got my ass handed to me in the Jezebel Plaza fight. Was it absolutely pathetic that I died so early these two attempts? Yes. But for each of these two deaths, I was also able to cause the death of something else. In the first case, the death was this GCPD officer, who met his end after I performed a beatdown at 3am, gone wrong. In the second case, the death was my credibility as a competent gamer, since even Slade Wilson with one eye closed would be able to get through the Jezebel Plaza fight. But that was it. With this long line of failed attempts, terrible gameplay, and embarrassingly stupid deaths, I decided to stop throwing for content and actually complete the challenge. Rather than just going in and trying the same thing I had done a million times before though, I decided to do some intense research before this last run. And by intense research, I mean I watched a couple speedruns. Also, I actually watched the speedruns before run 15, not 17, but the script works better thematically if I lie and say I did it here. Run 17 started from the same save file as 16, which is a decision I would quickly come to sort of regret, but also not really. Blackgate went fine. It went great, actually. I did a speedrun trick where you cape stun and beat down Croc twice instead of letting him throw the second explosive tank, which ended the fight quicker. It was the first GCR tower where I started to regret not starting from a fresh save file. Basically, the Dark Knight challenge, perform an inverted takedown, vent takedown, and wall takedown doesn't work exactly like advertised. I know, how surprising. Normally, I could go through the first GCR tower with only one wall takedown, upping the counter to one out of three. This meant that in the future, I could choose between being able to use inverted takedowns or vent takedowns for the rest of the run, since as long as I only did two of the three takedown types, the challenge wouldn't complete. But, for whatever reason, if I did the GCR wall takedown in one attempt, and then failed and used that same save file on the next attempt, the game counted the GCR wall takedown again. This meant that both inverted and vent takedowns were off limits for the rest of the run if I wanted to leave this Dark Knight challenge uncompleted. The run still wasn't too bad without them, but it definitely could have been a little easier if I had the option. After a much better Jezebel Plaza fight, I unlocked the second GCR tower and decided to do a little experiment here. Since at this point I had already listened to this conversation between Batman and Enigma 200 times, I thought that maybe if I fast traveled out of the area, I could skip the conversation. Much to my surprise, the game did allow me to fast travel while still locked in this room. But, instead of skipping the dialogue, all it did was send me to the opposite end of the map with the second tower still locked. 
So, I had to glide all the way back just to enter and exit this door so that the game could progress. And you want to know the best part? Because I fast traveled away in the middle of the conversation, the game refused to unlock the fast travel point for me. So, I guess I found a way to permanently lock yourself out of unlocking a fast travel point. I'm not sure why you would ever want to do this, but now you know how. After unlocking the Park Row fast travel point, it was time to head to the final offer. Within a matter of minutes, I was able to silently take down the snipers, backclaw most of the remaining thugs over ledges, and then quickly take down the remaining ones with a smoke pellet. Inside, I breezed through the first big combat encounter, completely skipped the second one using a speedrunning trick, and then made my way to the boiler deck, where I took down Electrocutioner for the 15th and final time. The boiler deck fight started out really well, but after making one small mistake, I proceeded to get my Batusi pounded for the rest of the fight because I couldn't seem to hold a combo or avoid any damage. I did still get through the fight, but it definitely wasn't a great display of my combat abilities. And the rest of the final offer was pretty easy. I did struggle a bit with the casino fight, but managed to scrape by and then lock Tracy in the cage she is next to her desk for no reason. I actually skipped the fight against the Brute and the Martial Artist by placing Explosive Gel on the floor here before they opened the door. Then I detonated it after the Brute kicked the door open beat him down, and dove through the door before it closed. I actually accidentally discovered this on my own in Run 4, before finding out it's a common speedrun trick. After that was the Predator encounter in the theater, a short fight against some of Penguin's thugs, and then I was on to the Deathstroke fight, which I had all but perfected by this point. Once again, I beat him without taking any damage a feat I managed to accomplish 5 out of the last 6 times I fought him. The GCPD was pretty standard. I avoided this vent takedown by just opening the vent and knocking the cop out normally. I skipped the fight against Michelangelo and his friends by backclawing this vent and then grappling up to it before they spotted me. I also skipped the first fight in the holding cells by just ignoring the cops and heading straight to the disruptor. The GCPD was insanely easy in its totality, and next up was the sewers. Although the overflow fight is skippable if you just throw a smoke pellet and then blow up the wall while nobody can see you, I decided I wouldn't skip it because it actually is a decently challenging fight. That said, this fight did not go well. I was dropping combos, taking damage, trying to counter enemies who weren't even attacking. At this point, I was considering throwing the run because my gameplay, although good enough to not die, was so unbelievably awful for the first few hours. The thought of this being the run that I would have to upload to the Proof channel for everybody to see was making me want to just start over. But I wasn't going to give in. I wasn't going to let the game win. Shitty gameplay or not, I was going to win this attempt, and everybody was going to see it. So I pushed on, and immediately got my ass kicked in the elevator fight, but redeemed myself with an absolutely flawless fight against this group. The Merchant's Bank was extremely easy, since after a quick silent takedown on the Jammer Thug, I abused the bridge to knock out most of the other thugs. Up next was the Steel Mill, which I found out is much easier to enter if you just take out this one sniper and then ignore everybody else. The first few fights here were easy, and by the time I got to the warehouse, I hadn't taken any damage at the Steel Mill. I pretended I was Waka Flocka in the paint when going up against the first wave of warehouse thugs and went extremely hard on them. You listen to Waka Flocka at all? Is that a band or a song? That's a, a man. And although I did get manhandled by the brute more than once, I was able to clear the second wave and head to the easiest predator encounter of all time. The drug lab, like always, was over with just a few uses of batarangs and my remote claw. And once again, I used the tried and true method of abusing the dodge over move to finish the copperhead fight quickly and easily. The Royal Hotel was next, and things were starting to pick up here. Despite a few hiccups, I took down everyone in the parking garage without too much trouble. Just like the overflow fight, I know this one can be skipped. The main reason I didn't skip this fight though was because it requires you to activate a button through a wall, which I feel is too close to a glitch to be allowed. The Royal Hotel lobby went fairly well. Once again, abusing the remote control battering to knock thugs off ledges was the main strategy. From here, I made my way through the hotel, obliterating my enemies in combat encounter after combat encounter, and eventually coming across Joker's bomb. After disarming it and riding the news helicopter up to the panorama fight, I had a massive scare when the game failed to spawn me in. 
Even though I wasn't super proud of my performance early on in this run, I still wasn't taking any chances. So, I reloaded from last checkpoint to make sure the game couldn't use any ancient voodoo magic to kill my run. After respawning, I did decently well in getting through the panorama fight before heading to the pool, an area I was absolutely terrified of. To start, I took down two armored thugs, since I knew that getting as many of them out of the picture as fast as possible would be the best move. Then I took down this guy and fled to the vents so that nobody would find me. Watching all of these mercenaries run straight towards me, knowing that if even one of them took a slight glance inside the vent, my run would be over, was horrifying. And because apparently I wasn't stupid enough already, the first thing I did upon leaving the vents was take another guy out and then immediately go back in. But lucky for me, it seems like Bane's guys didn't go to a reputable university like Squidward Community College when obtaining their degree in vigilante killing. Because not one of them had enough intelligence to check out the obviously missing vent cover right next to their two knocked out friends. I played things safe for the rest of the encounter, and after being reminded once again that the disruptor chugs balls in this game, I managed to clear the room without taking a hint of damage. Overall, I did very well against Bane, but the few hits I did take left me with only a third of my health going into the end of the fight, which was absolutely terrifying. But despite my fears, I whittled down his health and survived the final Bane train, finishing the fight for just the third time in 17 runs. The free fall and joker sections are nearly impossible to fail the challenge on, so next up was the GCPD morgue. I got hit a few times at the beginning, but by the time I finished the fight against these cops, I was doing pretty well. Bane's hideout was extremely easy, since the scariest part of that entire section was avoiding the snipers before entering. Bane's HQ was so boring that I had to entertain myself with some good old fashioned murder. And with that, I was finally back at the Pioneer's Bridge. By this point, I had laid out a rule for myself. After getting to Firefly, I would make a separate save file to practice the fight in. And after I felt I had had enough practice, I would go back to the original save file where Run 17 started, at which point I was at the mercy of my skills. But before doing that, I still had to get to Firefly, which wasn't as simple or relaxing as I may have made it seem in Run 14. Arriving at the bridge, I used my powers to phase this guy through the ground before skipping the fight by just entering the door before anyone knew I was there. The predator encounter in the boiler room more or less played out the same way as last time. Remote control batterings are just so broken with their ability to launch enemies in this game. The second bomb was as easy to disarm as ever, and on my way to the third I gave this sniper some lifelong mental trauma by making his friend disappear from existence right in front of him. The third bomb had me scared, because after playing the worst Arkham Origins you've ever seen in your life, I was just one Logan Paul, also known as a mistake, away from death. But, having had enough manhandling for one day, I decided to put the shot gloves to good use and applied 50,000 volts directly to my enemy's skulls. Non-lethally, of course. The Predator section after disarming the third bomb was up next, and I was deeply dreading this. Being in such a small room with pretty much nowhere to hide while only being able to survive a single shot at most, and having no use of detective vision was absolutely horrifying. It also didn't help that I was stupid enough to think that the jammer was on a thug rather than the wall. This led me to try and lure the thug over for a takedown numerous times, only to be confused when the jammer never moved throughout the entire encounter. But, even with all of these massive hindrances, I still managed to get through the entire room without ever being spotted. Now all that was left was to make it through the combat encounter before Firefly, which shouldn't be too difficult with Gordon, I've defused three of the four bombs. Yeah, so I forgot the thugs in this room could lay down mines, and stepped on one right after the encounter ended. Given that I was about to go into a pretty large combat encounter, I thought for sure I was screwed. So I accepted my fate and started going towards the fight, before turning back to try and find a way to restore my lost health. But no matter how many Enigma data packs I picked up, my health would not come back. So I reloaded the game to save myself a trip back up to the top of the bridge, and somehow a small amount of my health had been refilled. Not the full amount, but a tiny fraction. And this was when I remembered something very strange. Around this time, I was also playing through Marvel's Spider-Man for the Pineapple Pie podcast. Shameless plug, go check it out. Anyways, I remember that in Marvel's Spider-Man, entering and exiting a combat challenge instantly refills all of your gadgets and your health. And that's when I got the idea. If I could just get back to the Batcave and access the training computer, maybe I could use it to refill my health. 
but surely the game wouldn't just let me leave the bridge in the middle of the Firefly attack. I mean, Batman would never... Yeah, no, you can just straight up leave at this part of the game and it does nothing to stop you. So I headed back to the Batcave, started and instantly quit a challenge map, and just like that, my health was fully restored. With a full health bar, I stopped to get some of Alfred's wisdom. The last half has and then headed back to the bridge, where I stopped the run briefly so that I could practice the Firefly fight. During my practice, I started by trying to figure out Firefly's attacks, how to dodge them, and when it was safe to throw glue grenades. And while beating him this way seemed doable, the number of chances he had to attack me was still very scary. That's when I started to wonder, what else can I use against Firefly? I tried searching for spots where he couldn't hit me, but those didn't seem to exist. Then I got an idea. What if the most useless, ineffectual, worthless gadget of all time was actually the best? What if the concussion detonator could finally be useful? And when I tried it, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the concussion detonator instantly stuns Firefly. So from here, I developed a plan that would help to mitigate the number of chances he has to attack. First, I hit him with the concussion detonator. After that, he would be stunned just long enough for me to throw four batarangs and then a glue grenade to leave him stunned for even longer. Then I could throw six more batarangs and right before he broke free from the glue, throw another concussion detonator. He was still able to attack me on occasion, but in general this strategy seemed to make him much less of a threat. So with this new plan in mind, I went back into the main save file and continued with run 17. I wish I could say my plan was perfect, but I've lied enough for one video. Throws were missed, damage was taken, but for the most part the plan seemed to be working well enough. By the time I got to phase 2 I had only been hit a single time and was feeling pretty confident. If I had only known how heart attack inducing phase 2 would be. To give you any idea just how difficult the firefly fight actually was, my health being so low in this clip is the result of me getting hit just 3 times. By the time I got to Firefly's final attack, where he covers the bridge with bombs, my health was about as low as it could get. But it seems like my practice had paid off, because against all odds, I managed to survive getting damaged by a single bomb during this last attack, allowing me to grapple onto Firefly, counter his final attack during the flying section, and finally end this nightmare of an experience. And with Firefly down, it was time to head to the Batcave, where I quickly stopped to watch some amazing content before discovering that Alfred had failed the challenge. Luckily, I was able to restart him from the last checkpoint, at which point Joker decided to ruin the moment by taking over Blackgate. I was expecting Blackgate to be the final trial, a true testing of the skills I had built up over all of my attempts. So imagine my surprise when Blackgate turned out to pretty much just be more of the same. I only got hit twice in the first combat encounter, and one of those two times was because of this thug using aimbot. Besides using explosive gel on the first thug and a smoke pellet on the last two, everybody in the Nexus Predator encounter was taken down with remote control batarangs. And in a cruel twist of fate, I found myself making a very familiar mistake. Because on my way to the Panopticon, I stepped on a mine. This was followed up by yet another bad decision, as I immediately reloaded the game from the last checkpoint in order to despawn all the mines in the room, not thinking about the fact that this would heal all of my lost health. And even though this breaks the rules, I didn't reset here. The next encounter was against 5 basic thugs, and I got through the entire thing without getting hit, so my health would have been fully restored soon anyways. I know this is just insane cope to try and justify me breaking my rules, but after playing over 30 hours of Arkham Origins in just 4 days, I needed to be done with this game. The fight in Cell Block B was decently difficult, and I took quite a bit of damage. The variety of enemies and amount of weapons they had access to presented a really nice challenge, and it's really a shame that nothing else in Blackgate really came close to this. The fight before the Panopticon was exceptionally easy, and even Bane wasn't anything special. I got through the first phase within less than a minute, and phase 2 granted me unlimited use of the shock gloves, which made things mindlessly easy, since I could just wait until he downed everybody and then perform a beatdown. And TN1 Bane wasn't that much more difficult. Even with a few of my takedowns doing such little damage, I was still able to take him down without ever being hit. It also helped that for whatever reason, the detective mode jammer that's supposed to activate towards the end of the fight never did, so I always knew where Bane was. So, without much issue, I whittled down Bane's health bar, 
complete the quick time event to finish off the boss, and was off to help Gordon save Warden Joseph. I did drop my combo a few times during this fight, but in the end I managed to finish off the final fight of the game without getting hit a single time. Gordon can't exactly say the same though. And with that over, I headed to the chapel, beat down Joker, and proved that no, you cannot beat Batman Arkham Origins I Am The Knight without any upgrades. In total, the game mandated that I obtain 5 upgrades during the run. The Concussion Detonator, Shock Gloves, Remote Claw, Disruptor, and Glue Grenade. This was definitely the longest and most difficult challenge I have ever done. All of my attempts are spread across 18 video files that add up to over 31 hours of footage, but it was still insanely fun. And with this achievement under my belt, I am confident in humbly pronouncing myself the greatest Arkham Origins player of all time. If there's interest, maybe one day I'll continue this run, completing as much of I Am The Knight as I can without any upgrades. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you. Be sure to check out my other content, as well as the Pineapple Pie podcast, where I'm a co-host. We just released a video on Marvel Spider-Man, and already have two videos about Arkham Asylum, so go and check those out. If you enjoyed the video, then give it a like and comment. Dislike the video if you disliked it. And seriously, like, how are you not subscribed yet? How did you click on this video and not instantly become compelled to subscribe? That's all I've got for now. See ya. The last